heard is that uh, Gent is not a genre. It was not the easiest album to make. But uh, but for you, uh, what were the main difficulties then? Uh, I'd say definitely like related to the pandemic. If it wasn't directly from the pandemic, it was at least things that sort of extended from that that the, that dynamic because uh, it was very difficult to meet up. And we sort of discovered that it was very important that we all meet up. Um, I suppose once you are uh, not able to do something, you sort of realize how important it may actually be. So it it was it was something where where we realized that if we weren't all present for the recording sessions and the writing sessions. Maybe not the recording sessions, but really the writing sessions. If we weren't all present for that, it was like we could get about 80% there, but that's about it. So we, you know, we, we noticed that we were about a year in and what, and what felt like a really long time in. And although we had a lot of ideas, we didn't really have anything concrete. We didn't know what our album sounded like. We didn't really know if we had any strong songs because when a song is only 80% complete, you, can't even be excited about it, right? It's maybe this will be an idea, but maybe it won't. And and truthfully, a lot of those um, 80% complete ideas never saw the light of day um, because we just never felt like they were strong enough to continue on or we just could never get them to work. We ended up writing about two albums worth of material and, you know, scrapping a lot of it. And it's very demoralizing. Add to that the fact that, you know, when we would meet up because of travel restrictions or whatever, we didn't actually know when the next time that we would meet up would be. So it just created a, a, a dynamic that was very frustrating, I think. Yeah. Is there anything positive to find from that time? Like, are you doing uh, something differently from now on? They always, they always say it's not a mistake if you, if you learn from it. So I think what we can learn from it is just not to waste time, uh, writing separately there's certain things that can be done separately like the, the very initial ideas but once we need to finalize a song trying to do it with like four of us and one on zoom just doesn't really seem to work and um you know the making sure that we meet up all together or not at all also i'd hope that next time there's not a pandemic so we don't have to navigate around that but you know you never know what what, what what's going to happen so i think it just showed us how to maybe optimize for future situations um, in a way that maybe, you know, and we didn't know any better. You, you, you work with what you've got. We tried to do the Zoom thing. We tried to do remote. But there's nothing that really beats be the magic of being in a room and having the energy sort of bounce around and having the ideas bounce around. And when one person is missing from that and one person who's sort of essential to the process or whose input you need. We need everyone's input. It's very tough for them to sort of be in the room with that. How was the process of uh, eliminating material then? As you said, you wrote like a couple albums worth. Yeah, just, I mean, it's a, that's where it's sort of business as usual. Um, we always say, am, am I allowed to swear on this? Yeah, of course. Yeah, okay, okay, good. Yeah, because we always say, we always say like an idea has to be a fuck yeah, you know? Um and that is maybe a little bit hard to define. It's, it's abstract, but we all know when we feel it. And if we don't feel that way, you know, then we either fix it and, until we feel like it's a fucky idea or we just ditch it and work on something else. So that's, that's the part where it's very simple. So, so it's not hard to ditch ideas. It's not hard to identify when there's problems, but it is the demoralizing when it feels like we're never finishing anything or never quite getting there. And eventually I think we realized like, oh, like when we actually all meet up and we're actually all here, um, we actually start to make progress. And, you know, uh, some of this was also just difficult because Matt had a kid and wanted to be very careful, um, you know, having having a, a newborn and traveling when, when you know, you're in the, the throes of COVID is not the most most exciting thing in the world. So I think he just wanted to be very careful as he should have been. Um, so we were just trying to work within all the, the parameters that we had to work within. From these uh, nine songs then, for you personally, what song kind of represents best uh, 
the strife that was making this album? I don't think there's a song that, that really represents that because the songs are like the good moments, you know? Um, there's, certain, there's certain people that believe that, that good art is only created during strife or difficult moments. And I don't, I don't agree. I, at least not for us. I don't agree. I think songs are for us are, are generally created in times where good things are happening and times where everything is coming together. Um, so even with a challenging process, I don't think we gained anything from that. And the other albums, um, that I'm most proud of, for example, like, like I'm still very proud of Periphery 4 and that was a very easy album to make by comparison. So, yeah, I don't think that there's any song in our discography that would really represent that. There's some songs that are like easier to put together than others, but, but they're all, they're all kind of fun once you get into the swing of things. Okay. Would you like to de- then uh, maybe tell a background story of uh, one of these nine good moments? Uh, Dracul Gross, Fat Dracula, as we call it, is a good example because that's a that's a long song. Um, and we never really set out to write long songs, as funny as that that sounds, because we're usually cutting stuff down quite a bit. We're trying to trim the fat quite a bit. But that song, uh, I'm very happy with how that came together. It felt like it came together very effortlessly. So sometimes it just feels like you're watching this thing get assembled before you, you know, and you're just part of the process you're you're you're, you're almost uh, just you know you're just a, a passenger in in the process and uh i don't know i thought i thought that was a, a one of those things where it sort of like almost impossibly came together because there's so many things that that it's doing where it could fall apart or it shouldn't work or whatever um you know there's a lot of syncopation a lot of interesting chord changes a lot of stuff where it could be very challenging and challenging is not a problem. We, we like to solve problems. That's kind of what we do. But then sometimes every now and then you get a song that just sort of assembles itself before your very eyes. Uh, and you don't know why. And you're just like, man, that's lucky. Like, I wish, I wish I knew how to recreate that. So, um, I think, I think that one, um, that one, that one's pretty cool because it just seemed to happen. It just seemed to happen very naturally. And I'm really happy with, with you know, if you did all that and it just didn't sound good, it wouldn't matter. But like, I'm, I'm very proud of that song. So that's probably like one of the highlights as far as just how it felt to put it together. And how does the rest of the year look like for Very Very? And most importantly, is there a European tour? Um, so I'm not I'm not allowed to talk about anything that hasn't been announced yet. So anything that uh, that has been announced, you know, is public knowledge. Um, you know, we have a tour that we're embarking on in about a week, which is a U.S. Uh, secondary market tour where we're supporting Under Oath, and then we have a, a we're doing Radar Festival in the U.K. But other than that, I can't say I'll get in trouble. So. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, there will, there will, there will obviously be, there will obviously be uh, tours in, in, you know, like a proper headline tour in, in U.S., Europe, all that fun stuff. I mean, these are markets that we can't afford to ignore. Uh, they're they're very strong markets. For example, I think, <clears throat> I think London may be the biggest show that we've we've ever uh, headlined to. You know. Um, I do know that there's some difficulty with with touring Europe at the moment. So just, just cost wise, logistically, it's, it's a bit, a bit worse. And, you know, the, to tell you the truth as, as an American band, um, it doesn't matter how well we do in Europe, European tours are always very costly and it's very, it's very hard to walk away with money after a European tour, just because of the, all the, the cost expenses, taxes, et cetera. So, um, if that's the kind of thing where that then just turns into like a loss, it may not be worth it until we can find a way to make it. You know, I think we I think we can break even off of Europe. Then, then we're happy to do that. So, perhaps at that point in time, but that will absolutely happen. That has to happen. It's always an essential part of our tour cycle. So, worry not. Maybe we could also take a look uh, in the past and in a couple of years. Uh, very, very can celebrate the twentieth 
anniversary, which is quite oh, amazing. No, don't say that. Don't say <laughs> that. Don't say no. No, but when you when you think about the early years, you know, uh, maybe two thousand five to two thousand ten, like what are the first things that come to mind? I don't think about that time period. It's so long ago, you know. It's uh, it feels like it feels like I'm looking at a different person's life, almost. You know, um, I don't know if it's like that for you or or if anyone uh, who's watching can relate to this, but sometimes I feel like things from your past, like let's say from like 10 years ago or whatever, almost feels like you're watching like a movie of someone, you know, or it's like, you know, these things happen. So I'm, I'm aware that those things happen, but I almost feel like I was inserted into someone's life because yeah, it, it, you know, that was a very different person, um, which I hope would be the case, right. You know, that, that probably is a sign of growth, hopefully, but, but yeah, I don't, you know, I have I have bits and pieces I remember from that, but it's such a different uh, such a different life and dynamic from from now. You know. Yeah, if uh, everything's changed, then you know what are the things that have remained the same with Periphery? I still make music in a bedroom, um, <laughs> so that stayed the same. And actually, ironically, I think Periphery occupies the same sort of space mentally that it did back then, which is. You know, it's a passion project. It's something that I do because I enjoy it. I sort of make my living another way. And then I can just enjoy periphery for what it is, um, which is a musical outlet, you know, creative outlet that I get to share with some of my best friends in the world. And uh, and and we kind of get to do it for the love of it and the fun of it. And maybe ironically, like I have the same amount of creative control as I did back then when, as when we were first starting, because, you know, we are the label in our management's basically in lockstep with us. So there's not really anyone who's telling us to do things we don't want to do. We just kind of get to dictate uh, what, what part of our lives this band occupies, you know? Like a rage, 